This week, we'll continue exploring machine learning with Scikit-learn, looking at nearest neighbors classifiers and test train splits using the Rain in Australia dataset. Welcome to another MetPy Monday. Hello, I'm John Lehman, a software engineer for Unidata. On this week's MetPy Monday, we're going to use a free data set, the Rain in Australia data set, and see what we can learn about nearest neighbors classifiers and classification problems in general. We'll keep exploring more classifiers and ways to score how they do in future Mondays, but this week I want to get our data read in, do a simple splitting of the data, and explore a K nearest neighbors classifier, probably the simplest classification algorithm that you can use. So let's go to a notebook. And as with all things Python, we're going to start with imports. Importing pandas as pd. Importing numpy as mp. Now we're going to read in our data frame using the read CSV method is the weatherAUS.csv file. And let's look at the head of our data frame, see if it read in correctly and what we've got. Well, we see we've got some dates and locations, min temp, max temp, rainfall, but there are 23 columns. So if we just look at the columns attribute, we can now see a list of everything that's there. Now, not all of these columns are populated for every row or populated at all. So what we need to do is pick out some features, and then we're going to train our classifier based on those features and see how it does. A good thing to look at first is we'll just look at the info method on this data frame. So we've got 145,000 640 entries, so quite a few here. And let's look at how many non-null entries there are and what the data types are. So the nearest neighbor's classifier can't handle NANs and it can't handle uh, non-numeric or things that aren't easily cast to numeric. So for example, a wind direction of W doesn't mean anything. Now what I want to find are some columns that have lots of non-null values so I don't eliminate most of my data set because with machine learning we need large data sets and some things that I think may be useful. I'm going to start out with a pretty simple set. Min and max temps, the rainfall for that day, and the pressure at 9 a.m. and at 3 p.m. so we can get some idea of pressure trend. Now our whole goal is going to be to predict the rain tomorrow column. And rain tomorrow in this data set is defined as anything over one millimeter of precipitation. So I want to know based on the conditions today after I get my 3 p.m. data, is it going to rain tomorrow or not? Okay, so we need to do a little bit of pre-processing. And this is the story of all machine learning, and we're going to get into more advanced pre-processing as we go on. But first, I'm going to make a list of my features. They may ask, how do I know what features to use? Well, you don't. This is where you've got to get creative, try different sets of features, do lots of trials. And you can even do something called feature engineering, where we take features and combine them or manipulate them. We'll have you know, say some value and then the log of that value or the square of that value or that value plus another value to create a new feature that we don't actually have in the data set but is derived. And sometimes those derived features can really help performance of the algorithm. I'm also going to create a list called check rows. It's going to be a copy of features. and I'm going to append to it the rain tomorrow column. So rain tomorrow is not a feature that I want to use to train my, uh, well, we'll use it in training, but we're not going to use it. We're not going to know that beforehand, but I do want to make sure that it is a valid value because as we can see here, there are only 142,000 non-nulls. 
So there are some null values in there. And again, k nearest neighbors can't handle those. Okay, so now we're going to use pandas drop in a. I'm going to say to drop in a on a subset equal to check rows. And we'll look at our info again. So now we're down to 126,600 entries. So we lost quite a few here. We, we lost almost 20,000 entries that didn't have those features as non-null values. And you can do some more advanced techniques, like you can impute those values, but for now we're just going to drop them if they're not there. That is the most straightforward method, if you've got enough data. Now when it comes to training this algorithm, we can't just show it the whole data set because, well, it's going to memorize it. These algorithms are very good at learning data, and if you give them enough fitting parameters and all of the data, they will get 100% accuracy because they will memorize the data set, but that trained result won't generalize well or at all. So its performance on data it hasn't seen before will be very bad. So what we do is we're going to split our data. We're going to have a training data set, which is the larger data set that we're going to use to train the algorithm. And then we're going to hold some data back. You also hear it called a holdout set. And that is data that we're not going to show to the algorithm. After we train it, we're then going to use that to test how well our trained algorithm performs. All right. So we generally call our data capital X, and we're going to get our features from the data frame. Y is our target, and that is the rain tomorrow column. From sklearn.model selection, we're going to import train test split. What train test split does is split by default three quarters of your data into the training and a quarter into test. Now that's done randomly, so we're not going to take the first three quarters and then the last quarter. It's going to randomly pull rows. Our X training, our X testing, our Y training, and our Y testing are going to come from train test split x, y, and then we're going to assign it some random seed or random state to start with just so we all are working with the same data. If you want to prove to yourself that it indeed split how I indicated, you could do something like that and see yes indeed we have 75% of the data in the training set and if you do the same calculation on the test you'll see we have 25% or the balance in test. Finally, though this is actually very little data preprocessing for most machine learning cases, we're ready to use the k-neighbors classifier. k-neighbors is really a multi-dimensional plot, and we take the n points that we're going to specify that are closest to the point that we are wondering about, and whatever those mostly are is what we're going to say this point is as well. How similar am I to the data points that are around me? In 2D, it's very easy to visualize, in 3D, maybe a little less so, and once you get into the higher dimensions, of course, it's impossible to visualize. But we're looking at what are my closest neighbors by some distance metric, and what are they? And that is probably what I am, too. So from sklearn.neighbors, I'm going to import the k neighbors classifier. Generally, we use CLF for a classifier, K neighbors classifier, and the parameter, or they would call it hyperparameter in the machine learning lingo that we can tweak and play with here is in neighbors. How many neighbors around me am I going to look at? And let's start out looking at three. Now, all the machine learning happens in one line, not necessarily that exciting. We're fitting based on our training data set. 
And now we can make predictions. We're going to call a predict method on our classifier using our test. So this is data that it's never seen before. And if we look at what ypred looks like, it's a bunch of yeses and nos. So what does that mean? How did we do? How many did we get right? How many did we get wrong? There are lots of metrics that you can use to analyze performance of a machine learning algorithm. And they all have advantages and disadvantages. We're going to talk more about how you can dive into that and get more than just a number. What's a confusion matrix? What do we use it for? What are some of these other scores that are out there? But we're going to look at the most basic one that we can think of right now, which is the score method. We give it our X test and our Y test data. If we look at the documentation, it's the mean accuracy. So what percentage did we get correct? 78.9%. Not awful, but there are some things that could be hiding in here. First of all, we could probably do better. We just randomly picked three neighbors, but what if there's a better number of neighbors? We can do something called hyperparameter selection or hyperparameter tuning. So I'm going to tune in the range of 1 to 20 a bunch of classifiers. So my k neighbors classifier in neighbors is going to be our n from this loop. I'm going to x train, y train to fit, and then scores.append, clf.score, x test, y test. This will take a couple minutes to run, uh, depending on your system and what range you're searching over. But you gotta remember, we're fitting 20 instances of this classifier and scoring them. So we'll check back in in a couple minutes. Okay, so we've trained all of our instances here. I'm going to import matplotlib.pyplot. Use our matplotlib inline magic. and plot our scores. So we can see the score goes up, including past three where we were guessing, but sort of starts leveling out somewhere around 10 neighbors. So out here, we're probably just overfitting and certainly using extra compute time. So maybe around 10 neighbors is, would be where I would pick and run my production version of this algorithm, if you will. But we still don't know the whole story. Because what we care about is predicting rain, potentially more than no rain, but we don't know what the distribution of our data looks like, and we don't know other than, well, it got up to around 80, 81% correct. Did it do that by just guessing all no rain or all rain? There's some tools we can use to examine it, and we'll look at those more next week. But it's something to think on. we can look at the distribution of the rain tomorrow. And sure enough, only about 20, 25% of our data set had rain the next day. So how can we look at these performance metrics in a more meaningful way? That's something we'll talk about soon. But over the course of this next week, I encourage you to go and play with putting different types of features into this. Which features work well? Do all of them help? Do none of them really do much more than what we've got? What do you have to do to get some of those features to wedge into this model since it only accepts these numeric values? I hope that you found this useful, and I'll see you on next week's MetPy Monday.